And that window's not open, buddy. <laughs> Okay. There we go. All right. <laughs> hey, everybody. Making a video today because I shaved last night. I like to document the smooth cheeks before they go away. I don't shave very often. Anyway. Benjamin writes, hey, KMO. There's been some interesting stories Timcast has talked about around civil war in the U.S. There was a video I sent the first time months ago when he straight up said civil war, like he wanted it to happen. But it's really that he sees it as inevitable. If you're interested in the topic, I've been wanting to hear it analyzed through the mindset of someone like yourself, who is experienced in going in and coming out of radicalization and fear porn scams like peak oil. I think there's a pretty good case for civil war in the future, but I don't think it will be at all like the first one. He makes a good point about parallel economies being a prelude to civil war in this video, but he didn't cite any historic examples, but maybe they're obvious to most people. Here's the video I just watched. I thought it was one of the best shows they've had because there were some disagreements. Most Democrats or liberals avoid the show because they don't want to be called right-wing for talking to centrist Tim. See if the video is interesting enough for you to finish. If not, don't feel like you have to. I appreciate whatever content sparks your interest. All right. Well, thanks, Benjamin. Um, I watched like half an hour of this two and a half hour podcast, and I'll get to the rest. Hmm. All right. <laughs> Thanks for that, Benjamin. Uh, first, a note on Tim Pool. If you regularly take in Tim Pool's content, I have no problem with that. I don't. It's not that I dislike the guy. It's not that I think he's systematically wrong on any particular point. It's just one of those only so many hours in the day sorts of things. And like, I actively like Joe Rogan. I like his personality. I like the way he has conversations. I don't listen to his podcast. It's too long. It comes out every single day. There's just not a Joe Rogan-sized hole in my daily schedule, you know, for me to fill with that podcast. With Tim Pool, there's something else going on, though, because I, I do have a bit of active avoidance, uh, and I think it's mostly just a matter of personal style. But again, I, I have nothing against the guy, so no problem whatsoever. And when I started to watch, like, Benjamin, he linked to two different episodes of TimCast. One was like a 20-minute segment. Listen to it. Yeah. You know, no problem. The um, two-and-a-half-hour one, I got half an hour into it, and then I just got pulled away by other things. I intend to get back to it. But more importantly, the guest that he had on that show was the author of this book, The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future, by Stephen Marsh. And Stephen Marsh was the guest on that two and a half hour podcast that I listened to half an hour of. And there's some good stuff in there. I'm, I'm interested. What I can offer you in this particular video is nowhere close to anything I would consider to be analysis. Um, here's just my thoughts. As you say, we're not going to reenact the first civil war, like with hard lines on the map and armies marching toward one another. It's, it's not going to play out that way. We don't live in that world anymore. What they were talking about, which was really interesting and which Benjamin mentioned in the email, is the, the emerging parallel uh, infrastructures. If Google and Amazon and PayPal and all the other you know, companies that together make up the infrastructure of the web and you know, also the financial world, if they decide they're going to shut people down for ideological reasons, like if you say the wrong thing on social media, uh, you, you don't get to bank anymore. You can't withdraw funds from your account. You can't transfer money to somebody else. Or if you do transfer money to somebody else, there might be an ideological check on it. If, if that comes to pass, well, then people who don't like it are going to try to build a parallel infrastructure. And that's 
You know, that's what's happening already. I think it's in the early stages. I think it's pretty rough. I think while Bitcoin originally, not the cat who's here in the truck with me, but, you know, um, <laughs> the original cryptocurrency, that was a result, that was a response to the bailout of the big banks and the players that caused the 2000, 2008 financial crisis at everybody else's expense. That was, you know, that was a response to that. But I think it's become the basis, not Bitcoin necessarily, but the whole cryptocurrency universe has left wingers seem to hate it. You know, the the left people that I talk to, that I follow online, they just, you know, they they reject, reflexively reject Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies generally. And I can't even reproduce their arguments for it. I, I don't even know if they have any arguments. They just seem to assert that it's fake. And, you know, if you're a leftist and you, you hate crypto and there's actually an argument for hating it, hit me up. You know, I, I will internalize your arguments. I will take them on board and consider them. But for the most part, I don't, I don't get arguments. I just get, I just pick up, you know, hatred, just the animosity toward people who are interested in Bitcoin. And I think it's because right now, the people who, who say, yay, fascists, racists, white supremacists, they shouldn't be able to bank. They shouldn't be able to send money to people. You know, they shouldn't be able to start businesses online. They shouldn't be able to travel or get on airplanes. Ben Burgess did, a, I think it was a video about this fairly recently. It's been a talking point. You know, I've heard him say it to a few different people that if that's your mentality, you are very short-sighted. <laughs> you were know, very short-sighted. Setting the precedent for shutting people down financially, for locking them in place financially because they don't believe the right things or they don't say the right phrases in public, the actual content that gets censored will evolve over time. And eventually it's going to get to the point where it's going to bite you in the ass, you know, and maybe you'll remember five, 10 years ago, you were a big cheerleader for it. And maybe you'll regret that, but you know, by then your regret is useless. You know, your regret and five bucks will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. So I plan to listen to this book, The Next Civil War by Stephen Marsh. <laughs> it's one of those things where I have an audible credit. I'm not going to burden on this book. This is a seven hour book. You know, I can, I don't know what they're asking for it. Uh, when I look at it on Amazon, it just says one audible credit, but you know, I'm sure it's like 13 bucks or something and the audible credits are 15. So yeah, I'm not burning a credit on this thing. But right now, you know, if you're talking about these issues, it's impossible not to talk about the, uh, the truckers demonstration in Canada, which like COVID, like so much of what's happened over the past couple of years, I can barely rouse myself to pay the slightest bit of attention to it. I just, I'm not against them. I'm not going to claim they're white nationalists. I'm certainly not going to claim that they're trying to depose the Canadian government. But at the same time, I'm not about to send them any money. <laughs> I mean, come on. No way would I send them money. You know, it's just a thing to sort of sit back and observe dispassionately. And that's, that's one of the most interesting things that I got in that first half hour that I was listening to uh, Mr. Marsh. What's his name again? Stephen Marsh on Tim Pool. So a shift just ended at the weed farm at the end of the road, and there's going to be a constant stream of cars going by for several minutes. So I'll pick up here in just a few minutes. All right. <laughs> that may not be all of them, but that's probably the bulk of them. So the author of the book, Stephen Marsh, he talks with Tim Poole on the Timcast about um, what he calls reciprocal radicalization. Actually, complementary radicalization is his phrase, and that's a better phrase <laughs> than mine. Um, which is to say that as one side gets nuttier, the other side matches them. And I really noticed this. I really noticed this. So somebody, you know, from time to time, people will write to me and say something to the effect of, 
you know, whatever happened to the people in the, the peak oil scene, and then they'll run down through the list of the people they think of when they think of the peak oil scene, and they'll describe how each person has gone off on some, you know, different tangent uh, ideologically. And I really see it. And I, I even see it in myself. And I don't want to see it in myself. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go that way. And yet we live in a time where particularly if you're trying to make a living online and, uh, you know, I have this niche thing going on, which allows me to, you know, pay my child support and uh, until recently pay rent. I don't pay rent anymore. So I won't say what I'm doing with the money that uh, I used to pay in rent. But I've got this little tiny little audience that has stuck with me for a very long time, you know, and they, they pay their seven bucks a month to hear me rattle on about whatever. And I'm so grateful for that. And I'm so grateful that there is an audience for somebody who is conscious of the possibility of complementary radicalization and who is resolved to resist it. And as um, Eric Weinstein put it, uh, resolved to resist audience capture, which is to say, discovering that my audience is pleased when I say something really um, extreme and to give them more of that, you know, to get the, the clicks coming, to get the, uh, the Patreon pledges coming. I am dedicated to resisting, defusing, uh, and otherwise not succumbing to this uh, complementary radicalization. And yet I feel it. I feel the pull of it. You know, even if it weren't for Patreon and, you know, if it weren't for me depending on keeping people's interest in order to keep money coming in, uh, I think I would still just be being online and seeing just the culture of Twitter. I mean, I'm not on Facebook anymore, so I don't see that. Uh, Twitter is really my main contact with, you know, the establishment social media platforms and just seeing the intense nuttiness. And I mostly see it on the left, although I absolutely realize that the right wing has not only are they as crazy as the left, they've been as crazy as the left for decades. It's just that was the fringe position or it was a fringe pocket in most conservative people's psyches. And for the most part, they were fairly sane and normal unless you got them on certain topics. But now everybody seems like they're on a hair trigger, like just ready to fight ideologically anyway. And this brings us around to the civil war idea. And again, Stephen Marsh, his point, or one of the points that he made in the podcast is that the left eats itself. The left is perpetually ineffectual. Yeah, they can, they can get enough people together to have a riot, but they don't have any long-term... I mean, some people within the left surely have long-term agendas, but collectively, there is no emergent agenda which really seems to be driven by prior planning and intention. You know, it seems very opportunistic, very sort of free-flowing, leaderless, and most importantly, the left is always looking to score, or at least people on the left are always looking to score these cheap, short-term ideological victories, and the targets of opportunity are almost always other leftists. So, you know, that's just the perpetual circular firing squad. They can't get anything done. Whereas the right, you know, the radical right, the hard right, they are slow, they are methodical, they are dedicated to these long-term plans. They are much better organized, and they are certainly way better armed. And Stephen Marsh, among others, say that, you know, the right, the radical right, is definitely, you know, in the big picture, over the long term, a much greater threat than the disorganized, pathetic left, even if they have spasms of violence, and even if, you know, as of this moment in history, they seem to have a stranglehold on you know, the HR departments at the big tech companies, and you can get fired or you can get kicked out of the public square for saying something they don't like. It's, they use it without discipline. They use it for short-term neurological feedback rewards. That's all they use it for. You know, they don't have the patience or the long-term vision or the organizational acumen that the right has been developing for years. And while I feel myself pulled to the right 
you know, in this, this atmosphere of complementary radicalization, I am resisting it. I also recognize that in the long run, the right is more dangerous, even though I just roll my eyes constantly every time some leftist compares some middle of the road, basically left leaning, you know, socially liberal person like Joe Rogan, who has one bad opinion, they call them Hitler. They call them Nazis. <sighs> you know, Ben Burgess mentioning him again in this, this video, he had a tweet recently where he said, here's an idea. It's, it's kind of radical, but stick with me on this. A person can be bad and not be as bad as Hitler. <laughs> it's possible, you know, but for so many people, it's just, it's such a, it's such a lazy, easy, reflexive thing. You said something I don't like. You're a Nazi. You're a white supremacist. You're Hitler. That mentality is so distasteful to me and just so easy to, to fixate on and focus on that, yeah, I can, I can lose sight of the fact that the right probably does pose a greater danger to democracy and civil society. But at this particular moment, they seem like the underdogs. And, you know, in addition to all the things about the, the new left, the woke left that I just find obnoxious and nauseating, the fact that the folks on the right seem, one, you know, they get mocked because they're interested in liberty. You know, they, the, the left mocks them for being interested in protecting free speech. And because, you know, the tech oligarchs who control the new public square are all, they're at least pandering, you know, to the woke crowd if, they, if they're not actually ideologically bought in. It just makes the right seem like the underdogs. And I'm, it's just part of my personality. I'm always going to step in on the side of the underdog something that I need to be aware of. So again, this is more self-analysis than it is analysis of the, uh, the larger uh, social zeitgeist. But, you know, I'm a member of the larger social zeitgeist. I, I'm a drop in that ocean. So maybe a bit of self-knowledge will have sort of uh, a fractal um, revelation effect. Like understanding the droplets lets you understand the ocean. <laughs> Don't think it really works that way, but there it is. Okay, I've been jabbering a while. I'm going to stop now. Post comments. Sometimes I read them. I mean, I always read them. I always read them. Sometimes I read them aloud on these videos. And for the most part, unless you've just said something that I completely agree with and I have nothing to add, I just hit that heart. I do respond, you know, typing. So talk to you soon.